Thanks for coming back. I know it's Father's Day and you had stuff going on, but it's, it's great to have you here. And uh, we're going to study together out of uh, Ephesians 4. Had a good morning this morning, wasn't it? The music was just fantastic. So just really rejoice in that. Thanks for, thanks for bringing everybody out. I just want to ask you to do something, if you would, from now on. It's sort of a habit. Um, let's go word of mouth. And uh, anybody that you know that might uh, want to be looking for a church and might want to, uh, to drop in on, on us, go talk to them. Say, hey, come on in. And uh, it could be that somebody that's not here that you love that, that was here before, they're not here. It could be that you could go and appeal to them right now and just uh, say nice words. Invite them back, right? And uh, we want to just start word of mouth, continuing to grow the church and developing the unity of the church. Well, let's pray. Father, out of um, the power of your word, Lord, speak to us tonight. Um, it is not the cleverness of, of the man's words. It is, it is your word speaking for us. We just yield ourselves, your servants, Lord, uh, knowing that we're nothing special. And uh, all we bring is just the emptiness of ourselves and the brokenness of ourselves and our past. We come to you and just offer ourselves to you. Lord, work through us to build each other up and uh, work through us, Lord, to just encourage God's people. Amen. Ephesians 4, uh, we've been studying this verse, but we're going to actually go a little bit further tonight. He says in Ephesians 4, you know it well, therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. How do we do that? We go on in the next verse, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. Well, you know that when you get a new labor ma label maker, you have to try it out, right? You ever had one of those? Somebody gives it to you, you buy it. It's like, oh, I can make labels, you know? And so you make a bunch of labels and you stick it on stuff, even if it's really obvious, right? It's like fridge, you know? You just want to <laughs> make that label. Well, we want to make a bunch of labels and stick it on things. We've talked about humility in idea form, sort of in theory. Uh, humility is the Holy Spirit stifling or working to stifle our desire to have power and control. That's really what it is, to submit us to the ownership of God, because each of us is, is a scrambling grabber trying to get the advantage on the guy next to us, and uh, humility is the Holy Spirit telling us to stop doing that, okay? So humility is a contact virtue. It works in contact with. That's that's, uh, it's, it's something we do in the church body, and we want to stick humility on things, and we'll stick it on everything because humility works in every situation. Humility works mostly in relationships. In the church, in, in the context of what we're trying to accomplish in these first three verses of Ephesians 4, humility is the exercise of trying to uh, preserve the unity of the church that the Holy Spirit has built. And in humility, we just begin to relate to everything in a different way because the Holy Spirit is now living in us. The first place that humility starts is in our relationship with God. We, we have to turn to God and say, I humble myself before you, first of all. I offer myself as your slave, and everything that I have is yours. So in humility, we, we have to first come to God and live in the face of the Father. And in humility, we come to God the Father and we say to him, I offer myself to you, I thank you, I, I, I can't thank you enough for what you have done. We worship the Father and we say, you're the only one in the universe, you, you are God alone in all of space and I recognize that. You've created everything. I agree with David 
what he said in Psalm chapter 8, when I look into the night sky and I see the works of your fingers and the moon and the stars suspended in, in space, what is man that you are mindful of him? What am I in the face of all that vastness of the stars? And we give God glory for just being so infinitely larger than us and we worship him and we depend on him we depend on the father for everything for never giving credit to ourselves because paul says what have you got that wasn't given to you what what, what do you know that somebody didn't teach you you we require everything made for us given to us taught to us we're, we're just completely dependent and yet god uh, in Romans chapter 11, Paul breaks out in that doxology in Romans 11. He says, oh, the, the depth of the riches and the wisdom of knowledge of God. Who has ever been his advisor? And who has ever got, given to God that God should repay him? So in humility, we look at God the Father and we, we bend our knee to him. And that should be easy to do. It should be automatic for us to do. But we have, we're self-worshippers, and so... We actually have to talk ourselves into that. We have to just remind ourselves every day, okay, okay, it's not about me. Uh, I've, I've got to give this to God and depend on him. So Paul bends his knee, Ephesians 3, he says, I, be, I bend my knees before the Father from whom every family on earth is named. He just bends his knee to God. And in humility, we also confess our sin to God. We just say, you already know that oh, I'm a sinner and you know that what I've done today. But John tells us in 1 John that we need to confess our sin, which means to agree to the same thing. Like you say something and, I, and I'm standing nearby and I say, I agree to that. I confess to what you said. So in humility, we confess to the Father and say, I know you know this, but I want to talk to you about my sin. And we we talk to him about our sin, and he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And in humility, we just humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord because he, he hates proud people because pride people get into his turf. That's, that's his stuff. And we just humble ourselves night and day. And we go to Jesus, too, and we, we come to Jesus in humility and dependence as well. Christ is our life. Paul said in Colossians, he's, he's our very life. Jesus said, you can't do anything without me. We, he is our master, he's our Lord, he's our king, he's our owner. He's, he got, has total possession over us. He's the shepherd. And without Jesus, there's nothing. We are nothing. Christ is the one who started this, Hebrews says. And Christ is the one who is the finish line. And so we, we look at Jesus and like the Father, we can't do anything without the Father, and we absolutely don't even live without Jesus having died and risen again. Christ has done 100% of the saving of our souls, and we can take no credit for that. How can anyone who has life in Christ, who has been saved out of this helpless mess, and you you know what you've done, you sinners. And who has been forgiven of countless tramplings against God and trespasses and countless more that we can't remember and haven't noticed. How can we be proud? How can we say, yeah, I'm pretty special? There's just no place for that. And we submit also in humility to the Holy Spirit because it is the Holy Spirit having come into our lives having entered our very bodies and dwelling in us forever. And he's in us and he is sealed by the, we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. How, we, we submit ourselves in humility to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God whispering and pulling us to do the will of God. And the Holy Spirit brings glory to Jesus through us and in us. It is the Holy Spirit who causes us to notice Jesus and to, to magnify Jesus. Jesus said, he will speak of me. And so when the Holy Spirit comes into us, the Holy Spirit causes us to speak and glorify Jesus. And in humility, we let him. 
Paul says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Well, we, in, in humility, we, we just submit to him and we, we just allow him to work in us so that we don't grieve him. We look at the elders in Revelation chapters 4 and 5 and later on again in the Revelation where the elders fall down. If you have bad knees, is that good news to know that you can fall down countless times forever and ever in heaven and your knees won't hurt? Can I hear an amen? <laughs> the elders fall down and the crowd falls down before Jesus and they worship him and they throw their crowns down and they, they give him all of the praise and they are just humble before him. The very, the very noise of heaven rises out of humble mouths. And, and humility then is the first thing we see. But let's add another word to make it powerful. You know, those of you who are experts in electricity, you've got volts and you've got amps, right? Don't touch those, okay? So uh, you, you have humility, and we've talked about that for a couple of weeks, but let's add the next word for power, okay? And the next word in verse 2 is gentleness. This word shows up through the letters of Paul a number of times, and it describes the kind of touch that we have in our interactions with each other, okay? And the basic idea of gentleness is to be under control, to, to have yourself under control so that what you have when you're with other people in life all over, with God, with people, with situations, you have a light touch, a gentle touch, and you don't le unleash all your power on something. And, it, and that's always been my problem uh, through the years, especially as a young man, I had three brain cells, but way too much muscle. And so uh, I would go around breaking things, knocking on doors too hard, slamming doors too hard, just, just breaking stuff, shovels, whoosh, poof, break the handle just because I'm like, you know, a dumb brute. And uh, just, I had to learn to be gentle. And gentleness is just simply not letting all your power out, just just having the right touch for that. You know, when you bring a newborn home, the newborn baby home, you perhaps have a toddler already in the house, an older brother or sister, and you know that you introduce the new baby to the siblings who are, are little preschool toddlers. They, you, you have to watch, right? You're always, you're always like grabbing their hands and, like, and you're always saying a thousand times, gentle, be gentle, because they want to go, ur, ur, you know? And their little fingers are like, grab, pull, poke. What's this? <laughs> right in the eyes, you know? And you're always saying, be gentle, be gentle, gentle. And you, you know, you have to be like right there to stop them from is deforming their, their little sister, you know? <laughs> you know that if you want to approach an animal and you want that animal to be your friend, you have to be gentle, right? You have to walk up to that animal and give it signals. You have to talk nice. You have to move slowly. You have to speak softly. And you have to give them signals that, that the animal is safe with you. You walk up on a dog and you want the dog to not... not attack you or respond badly, you just want you have, to, you have to come up and give it the signals that it let, let it know it's safe. And, and that's what we have to do in gentleness. That's, that's the idea of gentleness. You're, you're giving a signal to others that they're safe. You know, if, if, if you go in the hospital and you're visiting somebody who's in the, in the thrall of weakness in the hospital bed, you don't crash into the room and and yell like Robin Williams, good morning, Vietnam, right? You're, you're, you're walking in and you're being gentle with them. You're, you're using a, the right touch for the moment. Proverbs 27, 14, Solomon writes, he who blesses his friend with a loud voice early in the morning, it will be reckoned a curse to him. And I'm thinking Solomon knew that by experience, right? <laughs> Maybe a college roommate, it's like, dude, be quiet. So why are we gentle? Why are we gentle? We are gentle for the sake of a brother. So he can feel trust and safety. We're, we're considering them. 
So when we're, we have humility and gentleness, we're, we're sensitive to them and we're, we're making sure that, that they feel safe around us. And we are gentle then for the sake of the other person. It's, it's a selfless act so that he can anticipate that the next time he sees us, he's safe with us and we can build a relationship on that. He can count on us being gentle. And I was talking to the young people this morning about that. I was giving them marriage advice and I said, find somebody that is emotionally stable. Guys, you wanna know that when you walk in the house, that knife she has in her hand is for something she's using in the kitchen, right? And it's one of the payoffs of having adult daughters. They're all together today at a wedding in Ohio. The wedding just happened today. My, my adult daughters now describe me as gentle. And they say that when I'm around, they feel safe. I can live with that reputation. I mean, that's, that's my paycheck for, for all that toil. But just to know that they feel safe around dad. So some references to gentleness. You ready? 1 Corinthians 4, 21. Paul's writing to the Corinthians. He says, what do you desire? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? So if Paul set up an appointment with you and he said, I, I want to come and talk to you. And I want to talk to you about your attitude and the way you've been acting. Okay. Would you rather Paul show up with a rod to pound on you or to show up with a gentle spirit to implore you? Paul's coming. He's got an appointment with you. What would you prefer he do? You notice that when Paul writes to get people to do something, he comes and he approaches them in a posture of begging. That he, that there are a number of times when he begs people to obey God. I beg you to give your body a living sacrifice. It's your reasonable service to God. I implore you, he says here, to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. I beg you, brothers, become as I am. And he's just begging people. Humility and gentleness come to people bowing low to begin, not coming with this up from above energy coming down upon you, but, but coming from down low already. I'm, I'm just begging you. I come with my hands down low and I'm giving you the signal that I'm humble and I'm your servant and you're safe. Galatians 5.23, one of the fruit of the spirit is gentleness. Galatians 6.1 it says, brothers, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, the, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. This verse modifies our, what we read in, in Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20, when you know it well, it talks about church discipline, that if a brother sins, you go one-on-one, -on -one. He's not responding, so you go two-on-one or three-on-one. You bring witnesses. He's not responding. You come and you tell the church and you say, hey, I got a brother, and he's, he's just not in line. And so you bring it to the church, and they pray for it, and they, they try to, to, to work with the man, and, and then finally he's not, it's just not working, and so he is dismissed. If you read Matthew 18, it just sort of looks like you do that in sort of strict order, like, you know, you come up and you're, you're just as rough as you need to be and you're firm. But here, Galatians 6.1, it modifies that. He says, if somebody's caught in fault, and that, that's in the passive there, he says, the fault catches the guy, right? Like, like the guy got, it happened to the guy. And he may not have intended it, but now he's, he's caught in a trespass. He says, you are spiritual, restore him in a spirit of gentleness. So instead of just like the coming at him with ball bats and, and, and rods of iron to discipline a brother, we come up and we're, we're seeking restoration. We're appealing, we're being kind, we're speaking gently, we're being soft and we're trying to, to work it out and restore the man. The, the point of discipline 
is, is to restore, not to, not to send out. We don't start the process of, of uh, a discipline and restoration with the, with the thought in mind. We're just going through a process and we're hoping he'll get out of here. We're actually going through a process and we're hoping he will be restored to us. Philippians 4, 5, he says, let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. We should just be oozing just gentleness wherever we go. We're like a, we're like a bag full of squishy stuff and every time somebody touches it, it squishes out. Just let that gentle spirit be known to everyone. Colossians 3, 12. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Put it on. Put on this heart of gentleness. Now, very much like we talked about last week with, with Peter saying that you clothe yourself with humility. You just put it all over you so that the first thing people see and touch is, is the clothing you have of humility. Just put that on this heart of gentleness. First Thessalonians 2, Paul is talking about the visit of the apostles to Thessalonica. It was a very brief time that they shared the gospel in Thessalonica. They went there. They, they had just gotten away from Philippi. Their wounds are still fresh from the Philippian jail. They get to Thessalonica, and they come into the synagogue, and they have three Saturdays with the Jews in the synagogue in Thessalonica. And out of those three Saturdays with the Jews, the Thessalonian church was born. And Paul says, when we were there, you remember, we proved to be gentle among you. How gentle, he tells us, as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. What a picture of tenderness, right? They were in there, they still uh, just working on their bruises from having been beaten in Philippi, and <clears throat> they're thinking about nothing but giving a signal of gentleness and safety to the Th Thessalonian Jews. 1 Timothy 3.3, 3, one of the qualifications of an elder, he is not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but he is gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. An elder should not be a fighter. An elder should not be looking for a fight or an argument. He should not have any joy in just going chest bump against somebody and starting to bark at them. Uh, we don't need elders like that because the church is supposed to be a peaceful place. But, so we're looking for elders who are gentle. They're not there to create strife. First Timothy 6, 11, but flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. That's a big verse, so I'll just put that uh, subject and verb together. Pursue gentleness. Now, the word pursue is an interesting thing. It's what Paul did when he was chasing believers, when he was Saul of Tarsus, breathing out threatenings against the believers. He pursued the believers. Pursue is, means to chase ferociously, to capture something, like a cheetah after an antelope. It is something you're, you're doing very seriously, very focused, very high energy. Pursue gentleness. In other words, we're not supposed to be just go, letting gentleness float to us. And if it, if it never does, you know, we say, well, it just never floated to me. You know, I was waiting for gentleness to come to me. Oh, it doesn't do it that way. We're, we're wait, we can't wait for gentleness to come to us. We've got to pursue it, okay? We've got to go grabbing it with a ferocity. Like, we're, we're just really, really trying to get it. 2 Timothy 2, 25. This has to do again with arguments and, and how we deal with disagreement, whether it's a believer or not a believer. How do we do that? And especially if we disagree with people that are, they're in opposition to us and they're making life hard, with, uh, for us. What do we do? It says in, in 2 Timothy 2, 25, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition 
If perhaps may God, God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth. So we, we know we're supposed to be gentle and we know we're supposed to be gentle to those people who oppose us. But that is hard because we're dealing with our reflex. Remember the reflex we talked about last week where we want control and power and, and just the reflex of pride is to say, it's you and me, buddy, and only one of us is going to live. You know, and it's, and it's, you, you just have that competitive spirit when people rise up against you. And I know that when people disagree with you, it can grow that energy just as you're talking, especially if they're saying something that's clearly wrong and you know it. You're waiting for them to just take a breath and stop talking so you can go, yeah, but... And you, you want to raise the energy and cut them off and rebut them. But the humble, gentle brother, he takes that situation and he takes his time to answer. And he, he, just, he doesn't try to match or raise the enemy or the energy. Or he, he's just waiting for the right time. And maybe the moment that you're talking to that person isn't the right time. Maybe you need to go home. Maybe you need to take a couple of days to go off and get some ice cream and then come back when sanity has returned, right? The humble, gentle brother takes his time. It says in the Proverbs that the wise man studies how to answer. And uh, I'm the kind of guy, I'm a slow thinker. It takes six weeks for me to get a joke, you know? <laughs> I'm like, ah. Yeah, that was funny. You know, and it's oh, so slow. And, and when I'm in a situation where somebody disagrees with me, and it's like, you know, you got your, your little rhetorical swords drawn and you're clashing away. I'm, I can do that when I'm talking to Mormons because I've lived there my whole life. But outside of that, it's like, I'm too slow to know what to say to you. So I'm just going to sit here and just let the words come at the right time. Knowing the right time and the right words and the right place is called in scripture prudence. That's the word prudence, a very old word. But it's just knowing when you should say something or do something. There's a right time and a wrong time. And, and this is where that reflex for control comes into play because we want to recover control of the room right now but maybe it's not our room to control. You ever thought that, that maybe that's God's room to control and it's not your job to grab control of that person in the room. So humility and gentleness is, is not in a hurry. We're just not in a hurry to try to rebut people or win an argument. Titus 3, verse 1, Paul writes to Titus and he says, remind the people to be subject to rulers to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, but to be peaceable, gentle, knowing every consideration for all men. Now, here's where we got to have that large picture reason for what we do, okay? And, and this is where Ephesians is going. Ephesians 4, remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to keep the unity of the, of the, the Spirit. The Spirit is built the body. The spirit wants to keep it there and it's our job to keep it. Well, the, the larger picture of what we're trying to do in humility and gentleness is we are trying to build something. And the word that Paul uses a number of times is edification. An edifice is a building. It's another name for a building. So if we are edifying, we are building. And in our case, what we're seeing for the remainder of Ephesians 4 is we are building the body of Christ. So Paul writes about spiritual gifts in the church. In, in 1 Corinthians 14, he says, okay, so you guys are all fired up about spiritual gifts. You just want to get up and do flashy stuff, you know, and, and do all those spiritual gifts. But since you're all fired up about spiritual gifts, make sure that your motive is edification. Why are you jumping up and shouting in the middle of the assembly of people? What are you doing? What's your motive? You're trying to gather attention. You want people to be impressed. 
Uh, the, the people and the body have to be blessed and benefited by your spiritual gift. Don't do it for yourself. And he says, let all things be done for edification. All of our spiritual giftedness, all that we do in the church, each of us has from God a superpower that he has given to us that we can use to build God's people. And we should be using it for building. He says in Ephesians 4, 29, at the end of this chapter, if you're in Ephesians 4, you see it in verse 29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. So we're not supposed to yap away at people and talk bad to them and talk about their lineage, their mom and dad and stuff like that. We're, we're not supposed to be cruel with our speech. We're not to be, supposed to be sharp with our speech. We're, we're not to injure with our speech. We are supposed to build. So every word that comes from us ought to have some activity, some benefit of building the brothers, some benefit of building the body of Christ. Let all things Paul says, be done for edification. So why are we humble? Why are we gentle? We are doing it to build the body. And this fits into the entire scheme of chapter four of Ephesians, that ultimately we are building toward everybody being mature in Christ, the whole body looking and smelling like Jesus. We are humble and gentle so that we can build other people for God. Amen? Well, let's apply it. Uh, let's find some places if, uh, if, if humility and gentleness are like labels we want to stick, we want to stick to stuff, let's stick some ways uh, that we can apply it, okay? Uh, we'll make a few. In, in, in grace and humility, we can restore a brother that we have struggled with. One moment. Paul appealed to Philemon, and he asked Philemon, can you, can you find it in you just as a favor to me? Be kind with your slave who has run away from you, Onesimus. So Paul in, is asking Philemon to have humility and gentleness in his heart for that slave. Now, that was not characteristic. It was not cultural in that time. If your slave did you wrong, you could do whatever you wanted to them. You could punish them. Paul asked for grace, for humility and gentleness. Paul apparently, because later on he talks about this, he apparently reconciled with Mark and with Barnabas because later on at the end of his life as he is writing, he asks, would you, would you please bring Mark with you because it is, is profitable for me for the ministry. So, so sometime between Acts and the, the time that he dies in jail, Paul and Barnabas and Mark fix that little thing they had when they barked at each other and, and parted ways. They got it back together. That must have taken humility and gentleness to do that. Jesus said in Matthew 5 that if you're offering something in the worship center and you remember as you're doing this offering that you remember that there's a brother who has a problem with you, you stop your offering, you stop worshiping and you go and you make things right with your brother and then you come back and you finish the offering that you were making. So even in the middle of a church service, if, if you are convicted, oh, I know of a brother that's, that's really got a problem with me, it is okay for you to just interrupt everything and go and make it right, and then come back and continue to worship. And it is, it is in gentleness and humility as well that we pick up our mops and our tools and, and we serve everyone else. And sometimes we can think, well, that's not my job. I, I don't do janitor stuff. And, that if the toilet's clogged, it's not my problem. Maybe it is. Maybe God wants you in gentleness and humility to go and do that. And that's the spirit that Jesus was teaching 
when he washed their feet and he said, you know what I just did, right? I humbled myself and showed you how to do this. And you have that same attitude. And in gentleness and in humility, we can forgive our brother. We can just say, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm going to let you have that. I'm going to forgive you. Ephesians 4.32, it's where we at, where we're at in Ephesians 4, isn't it? At the end, he says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. So it is in humility and gentleness, in, in a tender heart, Paul says, we look at our brother who may have offended us, may have done something really wrong, really, really may have injured us, and just as God has been kind to us, infinitely kind to, for, to forgive us, we do the same for others. And that takes humility and gentleness. And we have to work through that at times. We have to, we have to talk ourselves into that because our first reflex, that, that overcoming, winning, controlling reflex we have is, well, they did me wrong. And so I hope a truck hits them. And you have to just say, no, 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 God forgave me and I have to forgive that person. We don't forgive because we are prideful. When we're withholding forgiveness from somebody, it's because we think we're special. We think we're in the place of God. Joseph talked about this with his brothers because his brothers discovered in Egypt, oh no, the guy that we thought we had done away with is now the boss. We are in big trouble. And they humbled themselves before Joseph. Then they sort of lied. They said, oh, by the way, before he died, dad said, forgive us, right? No, he didn't. Come on. You guys are still angling. And, he, and, Jesus, and Joseph said, do you think I'm in the place of God? I, I'm not going to do that. That's a killing people just for revenge. That's a God thing. That's, I'm not going to do that. We have no just cause for pride because we bring nothing. And we have no just cause for unforgiveness. And we have to remember this in marriage as well, where you, you can just develop a case, sort of build up a case, and it can accumulate over time. And, and my wife and I talked about this as she dealt with women through the years. And now my daughter is a, is a, a biblical counselor herself. And I said, there's a mechanism. And, and it's sort of unique to women where they will begin to notice the things that their husband does wrong. And they start to just start add one thing to another and it accumulates. And he might be a good guy. He might be a nice guy. But you can actually talk yourself into thinking he's an ax murderer just because you, you've thought of all of his flaws. He must be evil. He left the drawer open. <laughs> Next thing you know, he's killing the neighborhood, right? And so you just talk yourself into that. And, but we have to be just humble and gentle and forgive. In gentleness and humility, we can make our workplace a better place for everybody. Because out of all the complaining, you know, because it happens in the workplace, if there are people and there's a workplace, there's complaining, right? And there's passive aggressive head games where people are just working on each other. We can be the one, we can be the island of calm that is the, the, the peace and the humility that you bring. We, we can be the one who does not add to the tension in the workplace. In gentleness and humility, we can fulfill 1 Corinthians 13, 5. I'll read it for you. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. But in humility, we just erase that. What right do I have? A slave who is pulling an oar in the bottom of a Roman ship. What, what, weight, what, what right do I have to keep a record of somebody else's wrong? I'm just not in that place. I'm not above another person. That's for people who are important, not for us who are slaves. And gentleness and humility gives us social flexibility as well. I just want to give you some verses on this, okay? Proverbs 16, 19, it says, it is better to be humble in spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. So it's better to hang out with lowly people, the people that, are, that just don't have all the power. 
Isaiah 57, 15, for thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy, I dwell on a high and holy place. So God is saying, that's where I live. I live on the top of everything, the top of the universe, right? But he goes on in that sentence, I dwell on a high and holy place and also with the contrite and lowly of spirit in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. So God says, I'm way up there, that's where I live, but I am also flexible enough to love the guy who's sleeping on the sidewalk. And I care about that guy and I'm, I wanna revive him. Romans 12, 16, it says, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. You see that? See, the, the proud man won't be seen with people below him. He stays with his homies up on top. They, they just sort of stay up where dirty people are not. But the humble man, he can reach all kinds of people. If he is willing to humble himself and reach out to the lowly, both the high and low. So you're not limited to just powerful and, and rich people. You can go all over because you are humble. And humility gives you as much cachet in the, the clubhouse at the golf course as well as the rescue mission because you, you reach out to them. Humility and gentleness are soothing. They, they bring peace and they bring an end to fights. And instead of the proud person just adding fuel to the fire, yeah, well, you too, and you, you start to just go that whole back and forth thing. Instead, the gentle person just tones it down. They call that de-escalating today, where you just, you just slow it down and, and, and the fight dies because one person just isn't fighting. Proverbs 15, 1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Isn't that, that is such a great crystallization of the, of the whole thing, where if, if, you, if we can just learn to be gentle and not add to the problem we already have, then it'll go away. And humility and gentleness, they soothe the sting uh, when we are injured by a brother. When somebody hurts us, bothers us, uh, since we realize we're not important enough to protest it anyway, we just say, well, you know, I, could, I deserve worse. So when somebody injures us with a word or an action, we say, well, I'm just a slave, so what are slaves for, you know? They're there to be beat, beaten on. So Peter tells us of, of Jesus' humility and his gentleness in 1 Peter 2. You wanna go there with me? 1 Peter 2, verse 21, very familiar words. But let's look at it in context of humility and gentleness. He says in verse 21, for you've been called for this purpose. So God has actually given us this assignment. This is, this is why we exist as the redeemed. You've been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. And you need to understand the whole context of 1 Peter. The whole thing is about preparation for persecution. Like when you see persecution coming and you're going, okay, it's getting bad. They're starting to deperson us. They're starting to make cartoons of us. They're starting to accuse us of stuff we didn't do. And they're starting to malign us. And now they're starting to walk up on us and take our stuff. And then they forbid us to worship together. And, you know, it's a progression. Persecution is always a progression until finally they, they isolate us and, and start to kill us off. That, that's, you're in the spectrum and, and, and P Peter is writing with the believers falling down that spectrum of persecution where they're probably gonna lose their lives. Peter lost his life shortly after he wrote this. So he sees the trouble coming and he's writing First Peter with that in mind, with just, hey, it looks like, uh, looks like they're starting to get unfriendly with us and you know where this is gonna go, right? And so Peter writes this passage in context of the likelihood 
of persecution. And under the next couple of emperors that they had in Rome, things got really bad. He says, for you've been, you've been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. He committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. And here's the, the, the important verse. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. And I'm sure in your margin you have there as well, 2 Corinthians 5.21, right? Because very similar verse. So Jesus in humility, Paul tells us that he humbled himself even to the point of death on a cross. The, the cross was a time of exhibiting all of the attributes of God in one short day. All of the justice attributes, all of the ferocious, scary attributes of God are, are there on display uh, when Jesus died on the cross, but all of the mercy attributes and all the, all the tenderness of God is there as well. And, and God is yelling. All of his attributes are being yelled at us through Jesus on the cross. But here, one of those things that he is yelling at us as he is hanging on the cross and he only says a few things. He's yelling that God is humble and he himself is humble. He did not chuck the energy back at, at the people. When the Pharisees said, well, look at him, and they start quoting scripture, he trusted in God. Well, let God deliver him. If he's the son of God, let him calm down. And they taunted him. And he didn't taunt them back. He could have taken care of business right there. He could have said, yeah, well, fry you, right? But he didn't. He just kept it quiet. Humility and gentleness build the body of Christ. And that's the point. And that's why Paul includes this and writes it this way. In Ephesians chapter 4, we're building the body because they work together like two-part epoxy to build the body and strengthen our bond together. Our job is to help everybody feel like they can be safe around us, that they can trust us, that we're not going to come up and mess them up, that we're not there to, to harm them, but we're there to, to grow together with them and love them and build them so that we can build this whole eternal body together and become like Jesus. And humility and gentleness enable us to rejoice as well and not go into a pout of envy when a brother or a sister are blessed by God. And, and pastors are the worst at this because uh, pastors in a, in a geographical area like a county or a region, they'll hear about how each other is doing. How's your church doing? How's it growing? You got people? And, and you, you want to know what they're doing. But if a pastor in the area, he thrives and the church is, is busting up, just doing great, the other pastors are like, well, I hope they have a fire. You know, and, and you're, you, you just have this envy, you know? And, but humility and gentleness, they just enable us to rejoice and say, God is blessing over there. Praise God. You don't have to be grumpy that God blesses somebody else because it's like, well, good. The God, that the wind of the Holy Spirit is blowing over there, that's great. So let's take it home, okay? Just, uh, and it's, it's Sunday night and you want to go home. Be thou humble and gentle. You know, just see how many humbles and gentles you can score, right? And start in your house. And just look, there are hundreds of opportunities for us to be humble and gentle in our homes. Just, just to... Do little things like pick up somebody's shoes or wash the dishes when it's not your job. Uh, you know, just, just make life better for somebody else. Surprise them. See how many you can notice this week to just, just be humble and gentle. Maybe, you know, you're, 
you're, you're thinking you want to get into a fight, but instead you, you realize, no, God wants me to be humble and gentle, and I'm not going to go there. Just glue the family. Glue the church together. Glorify God by means of the Holy Spirit coming into us, stifling our competitive spirit, and letting God be God in humility and gentleness. It's logical. It is, it is entirely logical for us to be humble, and it is terribly illogical for us to be proud because we got nothing to be proud about. Amen? Amen. Father, glue us together, your people, and keep on bringing people through the door that we can continue to glue on to this body. Lord, work by your Holy Spirit, work through your word, work through the prophetic books that give great, great glory to you because you, you are alone in all of space and you alone deserve all the glory. And so Lord, teach us to have a high view of you, teach us to have a low view of ourselves, keep on convincing us of that. And Lord, bring your church together through your spirit working to humble us, we ask, amen. You guys have a great week. Pray for the VBS and uh, pray for each other. Grace to you.